Hey, welcome to the Gentle Rebel podcast, where we talk about navigating life's harsher edges with a spirit of compassionate creativity. I'm Andy Mort. I'm a songwriter and creativity coach, and I explore what it means to have a firm back and soft front as we gently peel back the layers and understand how to be human in a world of machines. I'm recording this at the start of a new year. Things are really tough for so many people right now, but I can still sense a soft energy of hope and possibility in the world around me. There's a sense of wonder, you know, that sense of what might this year look like? What do I want to change in and around my life? Is it finally going to happen? I love thinking about areas of life that I want to address going forward into the future and things I fancy tidying up and investing my time in or creating next. And I've noticed over the years that I have quite a strong tendency to overcommit. I don't know if you're the same. I know many people have this uh, same issue. And I talked about this in the episode about shaping life around cornerstones with Brandon Bennett. The idea that people overestimate what can be done in one year, but underestimate what can be done in 10. And I want to kind of take this idea and, and kind of, yeah, like move with it along another path and explore the concept of pacing in life. In particular, what does it mean? What might it mean to slow down? Why might it be important to slow down? And how do we do it if we decide it's something that we want to build our life on? It's one of those things, one of those ideas that we might instinctively resonate with, but it's also in tension with so many of the pressures and the demands and the stories that we receive in the modern world. It might not need saying, especially to listeners of this podcast, that society's fast pace and hustle drive is not necessarily great for things like our health, our relationships, the stuff that we want to do more of in life. But how do we create a realistic alternative, especially when we have to survive in a world that does put the pressure and the squeeze on? Our quest for uh, productivity and uh, better time management often leads us to find ways to save time in certain areas, but then leads us to add more stuff elsewhere so that it actually creates more strain. It makes us feel more stressed because like, I, you know, I've, I've saved the time here, but I, I've got so much more on my plate. And I wonder if there are more helpful questions that we can ask in this area. Questions about how saving time can help us add slowness to what we're already doing rather than adding more to the list. You know, I don't have answers for your life. I don't want to spend this episode giving tips for slowing down. You know, everyone's in a different season and situation. And any time, any suggestions that I might be able to make uh, are only going to be applicable to a narrow group of people, people in a certain situation or demographic or whatever it is. Um, but what I want to do instead is to think about the idea of slowing down. You know, what does it actually mean to slow down? What are we thinking when we come at this with this, this idea that, yeah, no, I, I need my life. I need to, to bring more slowness into my life. What does that mean for you? What is the problem that we are maybe thinking that we're trying to solve when we ask this question, how do I slow down? And how are we trying to solve it? My hope is that we can begin to understand our individual personal pace a bit better so that we might be able to build rhythms for ourselves that give us the margin and the space to create more of what we want to create in and around our lives. It might be in work, in relationships, our creative endeavours, our health or our, our relationship with life in general. I felt pulled towards this topic of slowing down when I was uh, thinking about and planning um, a book club that we're, we're about to start in the Haven as I'm recording this. Um, we're going to be reading The Courage to be Disliked by Kashimi and Koga. And we're going to meet online um, and, and kind of move through the book over the course of four months. And I was thinking about, you know, how long four months actually is for uh, for one book and how, you know, at that pace, We've got time to read um, three books in a whole year, which doesn't feel like many. But I was also thinking about, you know, what might that make possible? How much more will we see, explore 
and experience by not rushing through the book? What will it give us the ability to, uh, like what, what avenues will we be able to take as we move through at that sort of pace? In the first chapter of the book, there's a reference to the form of uh, philosophical inquiry that takes place as the two characters that, that kind of make up the narrative of the book, uh, a young person looking for help with his, uh, essentially his existential dissatisfaction with life, and an old philosopher who's influenced by Alfred Adler's individual psychology. And they meet together over a series of nights. They are kind of days or weeks apart. Uh, these encounters, as you f- these five meetings that they have uh, in the philosopher's study. And it's mentioned that Adler took a leaf from the way Socrates did philosophy. He says Socrates didn't write anything down. He spent his days having public debates with the citizens of Athens, especially the young. And it was his disciple Plato who put his philosophy into writing for future generations. Adler, too showed little interest in literary activities, preferring to engage in personal dialogue at cafes in Vienna and hold small discussion groups. He was definitely not an armchair intellectual. And so this is quite in contrast to the desire of the, of the youth who the philosopher asks um, why he seems to be rushing for answers as uh, they begin to have their first conversation. He's looking for these solutions, for these explanations, for advice to hang his life on. And most of us do that, don't we? We gravitate towards, um, you know, certain ways of addressing problems or, or framing questions that we want help with. We move towards gurus and fads and frameworks that are sold to us as being able to answer these deeper and more enduring questions of life, or at least these are underpinned by these deeper and enduring questions of life. But the philosopher suggests that answers from others, when we are given answers from the outside, from, from other people around us, they're nothing more than stopgap measures of no lasting value. And that this way of exploring philosophy and our understanding of what it means to be us and what it means to be human are things we can only really arrive at for ourselves on our own. And as such, they take time. Showing up at the proverbial philosopher's door each week, venting, questioning, tarrying with discomfort, and trusting in what goes on beneath the surface. And then one day, in the future, we might start to realise that those problems that felt urgent, the things we were desperate to solve, no longer have the hold on us that they once did. Slowing down in this sense is about letting go of the need for control. Slowing down is about understanding that commitment to show up in the same place over time, that that is what leads to growth, and understanding that growth is about roots, what goes on beneath and beyond our immediate field of vision. before we see what goes on above the surface. The thing is, I have no idea if people are going to be interested in studying a book with me for four months Um, and people might come and go and yeah, who knows. But in a world where like tools like Blinkist and Story Shorts, Insta Reads, Snap Reads, those sorts of things provide quick to digest summaries of books, maybe there's less of an appetite to dive slowly into something that could be turned into a 20 minute snack size knowledge nugget. And I think there is a place for those kinds of tools. And actually, they can really reinforce and support slowing down if we want them to. If you know that you can digest the basic principles of a book in 20 minutes, it means you don't need to. It frees you to dive deeper into something instead, safe in the knowledge that, you know, if a request or a need to know about that book um, that is available in that snack size format comes about, you can listen to it or you can read it without any trouble very, very quickly. So in this sense, technology frees us to go deeper. It frees us to slow down. It frees us to look more deeply at those things that really appeal to us, that really matter to us. Again, if that's what we choose to do. I guess the problem is most of us, or many of us see this, this kind of more efficient way to consume as the, the way that we have to consume. You know, I've seen many people replace reading 
with these kinds of tools. Um, but to my mind, this just sort of turns us as humans into machines, trying to hoard knowledge that actually it's already been collected by these real machines. Uh, the, and that's there for us to use if we need to. Um, if we only ingest bite-sized nugget versions of these great works of wisdom, we don't actually enable ourselves. We don't allow ourselves to do what we as creative human beings are capable of doing and capable of doing in a way that machines aren't capable of doing. And we don't leave space and time and energy to invest in nurturing our own wisdom and understanding. I had a bit of fun a while back uh, when the artificial intelligence chatbot chat gpt came out uh, where you can essentially enter a prompt and it will generate a unique response based on ai learning techniques it's causing quite a stir in different ways uh, there's people with very different opinions on you know the the kind of application of this and, and the future of like where this is kind of leading us and that kind of thing uh, and it's a really quite remarkable um tool in in some of what it can do um, and I used it for my um, morning journal routine <laughs> when it first came out. So I added my normal question prompts and told it to write my morning pages for me. Um, and I tell you what, it was so much quicker. It was so much quicker to do it that way. Um, it kind of whacked out 500 words while I was playing Wordle. Um, and well, I'm, 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 jo well, I'm not joking. I did do it because it was like a good exercise in absurdity. But what, what I find um, amazing about something like ChatGPT is it can highlight where we're free to become human again. It highlighted, you know, where, like the value of journaling, for example, um, as, as a non-productive task, things that actually their, their enjoyment and their value and the things that make them um, worth doing are not the product of what they create. And also where we have made ourselves less human, less creative and more machine like we can see like it, it kind of holds a mirror up to this stuff as far as I'm concerned. And I imagine that we're going to see more and more articles produced by AI chatbots over the coming years. And, and also a lot of search engine results are probably going to come as bot generated answers rather than kind of links to articles that may or may not be a decent uh, like respond a result to your search query i'm not sure how much of it we've already seen potentially quite a lot and and if not we've seen humans chip away at our own creative playful idiosyncratic beauty by conforming to bland blueprints and models um you know most blog posts um blog posts and and general articles like that look very similar they look like they could have been created by machines um, so it's going to help us sort of, I don't know, help free us from these, uh, from these mundane blueprints and models that we've become uh, kind of wedded to more and more over the years. So take this, for example, um, I was, I was, when I was kind of thinking about this topic of slowing down, I just put into Google, you know, look, looking for, for what people were kind of searching for. Um, and one of the top queries was how does slowing down reduce stress? So I thought, okay, let's let's see what ChatGPT has to say about this. So I um I popped the prompt in, um, and it came out with this: slowing down can help reduce stress in a few different ways. It allows you to take a break from the demands and pressures of everyday life. When you're constantly rushing from one thing to the next, it can be overwhelming and lead to feelings of stress and anxiety. By slowing down and taking some time to relax, you can give your mind and body a chance to rest and recharge. Point two. It can help you gain perspective and prioritise your tasks. When you're moving at a slower pace, you have more time to think about what's really important and what can wait. This can help you feel more in control and less overwhelmed. Point three, it can help you be more present in the moment. When you're rushing through life, it's easy to get caught up in your thoughts and worries about the future. Slowing down can help you focus on what's happening right now, which can be calming and help reduce stress. Point four, the final point. It can help you cultivate healthy habits. Taking time to slow down can give you the opportunity to engage in activities that promote relaxation and well-being, such as exercising, meditating or spending time in nature. These activities can help lower your stress levels and improve your overall health and happiness. 
So that, that's a very neatly put together four point answer to the question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure you've read that article or articles are very, very similar to that. Um, I know I have. It's kind of very, very familiar. Um, but I don't, there, there's nothing particularly groundbreaking. I, I say particularly, there's nothing groundbreaking in that response at all. Um, you know, I th- think we've seen that so many times and it's really interesting that it sort of um, aggregates the, that and sort of generates this unique response but it's actually a very generic response at the same time so i thought rather than just asking you know why is it worth slowing down how about we get a bit more practical so i asked Ch- chat gpt uh, what would help me slow down in life came back with this nice seven point um seven point response to this one um and it's and it's a ready-made blog post there are many things you can try to help slow down in life One. Set limits on your commitments. Try to be more selective about what you take on and say no to things that don't align with your values or that you don't have time or energy for. Two, practice mindfulness. This means paying attention to the present moment and your surroundings rather than getting caught up in your thoughts or worries about the past or future. You can try mindfulness meditation or simply take a few minutes each day to focus on your breath and your surroundings. Point three, take breaks. Make sure to take regular breaks through the day to rest and recharge. This could be as simple as taking a few deep breaths or going for a walk outside. Point four, prioritise self-care. Engage in activities that promote relaxation and well-being, such as exercising, spending time in nature or doing something you enjoy. Point five, set aside time for relaxation and leisure. Make sure to schedule time for activities that bring you joy and help you to relax, such as reading, spending time with friends and family, or pursuing a hobby. Point six, simplify your life. Look for ways to streamline and simplify your daily routine, such as decluttering your space or creating a to-do list to stay organised. Point seven, try slowing down your pace. Instead of rushing through tasks, try to be more mindful and present as you go about your day. This can help you feel more calm and focused. So there you go, seven points in that response. Very succinct, also very familiar. Helpful? I don't know. I'm not so sure. I mean, it doesn't really say anything that we don't already know. And that makes me kind of think there's so many of these sorts of things, isn't there, that we we just it's regurgitating the same stuff that we we've already heard a million times before. And yet we're still asking these same questions. We're still searching for an answer or searching for a solution to a problem that when we are presented with the solution, it's like, yeah, I know that. (laughs) So what is it that we're looking for? Um, okay. So the final one, I'm going to, you know, you're probably sick of this already, but I I've, I've enjoyed myself too much looking, uh, just popping things into chat GPT. Um, the final one I asked it was, was how do I help my nervous system slow down and be less reactive? Um, and it says there are a few different things you can try to help your nervous system slow down and be less reactive. One practice relaxation techniques. Uh, This could include things like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation or meditation. These techniques can help calm your nervous system and reduce stress. Two, engage in activities that promote relaxation. This could include things like exercising, spending time in nature or doing something you enjoy. That's very familiar. In fact, that is exactly the same. I think exactly the same phrase as was, was in that second one. Number three, get enough sleep. Lack of sleep can contribute to feelings of stress and anxiety, so it's important to make sure you're getting enough rest. Four, eat a healthy diet. Uh, A diet that is high in whole unprocessed foods and low in sugar and unhealthy fats can help support a healthy nervous system. Number five, reduce caffeine intake. Caffeine is a stimulant that can increase your heart rate and make you feel more anxious, so it's a good idea to limit your caffeine intake. And number six, final one, seek professional help if needed. If you're struggling to calm your nervous system and manage your stress, consider seeking the help of a mental health professional. They can provide you with additional tools and strategies to help you manage your stress and live a more balanced life. I'm kind of glad it included that one um, because that's, you know, that's invoking the need for a real human being (laughs) in your life uh, rather than just an artificial chatbot. but yeah, at this stage, I imagine that one of the helpful things about something like ChatGPT, uh, certainly from the perspective of someone who creates stuff online, is that it's going to show us what doesn't need to be said again. 
you know, if you read, if you, if it can sort of generate a generic article like that, like those three, just from those prompts, I think it's been said enough times um, all over the internet already. So we're, we're kind of free to say and to do and to be something, I don't know, more interesting, <laughs> more creative, aren't we? And that's quite, that's quite helpful. So we, we can use, we can use those tools as like a barometer for uh, what doesn't need to be said. <laughs> you know, if, if your article uh, sounds just like that, then it's like, well, it probably doesn't need to be added. It doesn't, it's just noise, isn't it? It's just clutter. Um, and I wonder whether it will be a game changer when it comes to reconnecting with our creativity and humanness, this trajectory that we're on maybe around um, artificial intelligence, especially in the creative world. I really hope that that is where we're, um, where we're heading. You know, we're heading in probably many different directions with all of this stuff, but I hope that is one of, uh, one of the places. It's potentially going to cheapen um, certain things like, you know, content creation, as I say, like copywriting um, is, is going to be like, people are going to sort of resort to that because it's just cheap. It, you don't have to pay somebody to do it and it comes out pretty generically okay. But it's also going to hopefully increase the value of unique creative thinking and play. It's going to um, increase the value of people that can that actually know how to do this, like the craft, the skill of of copywriting, of creating, of writing. Um, and it's going to give us a reason to develop skills that only humans are, are, are capable of and to figure that figure out what that might be as we move into the next phase of of art and creativity. Maybe I'm being idealistic about this. I don't know. Uh, call me naive, but I want to be hopeful. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of both intrigued and terrified of a world filled with um, AI generated stuff. Um, but anyway, I think I've got off track slightly. Um, this episode is supposed to be about slowing down, isn't it? Um, a chatbot would never be this sloppy and unfocused. Um, Okay, so where, yeah, where's the link? Um, reading, that's where we start. Once. Slowing down while reading a book, inviting space to connect dots and seek discovery and exploration and the wisdom that comes when we integrate knowledge and experience and the lessons that we learn along the way in life. Oh yeah, and perception of pace is interesting as well. You know, going back to that, that kind of nervous system thing, when we're in a stress response state, we're alert, we're ready to act. Um, and there are studies that suggest that we may even experience things like um, music differently when we're exercising. For example, it can seem slower than it would if we were in a, a state of rest. Uh, maybe you talk fast when you're nervous. Maybe you hear other people's talking at an exaggerated pace when you're feeling anxious or afraid. You know, time can drag, can't it, when you want to get something over and done with. It's like, oh, this day is just, it's just never ending when you, you've got like... I don't know, some sort of test or something later on in the day or an interview or something. It's like, I just want to get to it and get it done. Or it might be that you have the opposite of that and the day just accelerates when you're really dreading getting to that thing. It's like, I haven't prepared. I need to prepare. Yeah, I'm not ready for it. And actually time speeds up in that situation. There's a really weird phenomenon that you may have noticed when listening to uh, musicians perform live. Um, I don't know if anybody does notice this, something that I've noticed as a musician, um, that, that we might naturally play songs faster uh, than the recording when we're performing. This was something I really noticed when I first uh, played with um, a drum machine or a sampler, um, which was kind of set at the right tempo. It's set to, to kind of play these samples um, at the tempo of the original song. Um, but then when we'd perform the, the songs live, it was like, this is so slow. This feels really cumbersome. It's like dragging so much. Um, and we're kind of wanting, wanting the song to just burst into life a little bit more. And that just felt like, yeah, it's the, the pace of this thing is being held back, even though it's exactly the same pace as the original recording. And, and it, in those situations, it's like really hard to find... Uh, to enter kind of sense of flow and connection with with the performance there's something maybe about the buzz of performing that changes the perception of time and we can use this and work with it you know find a sweet spot like ended up often just pushing pushing the samples or uh, the the the, pay, the tempo of these of these 
drum machine loops a little bit faster um, so that it actually just felt more natural when playing live. But that didn't mean it was at the wrong pace on the original recording. It just meant that there's just these little slight differences in these different contexts. Um, and we can also use things that help us to slow down. You know, I, I think there are live versions of songs that I like are not that nice to listen to because they f- they're so much faster. They feel like they're rushed and, and the kind of the tempo changes within them. It's like, what's going on there? Like, there's some crazy stuff going on for, for whoever's playing this. Um, and this is like that tendency that we might have to talk fast when we're nervous. Sometimes that might be just a, a simple desire to rush through an experience because it's like, I want to get this done. So I'm like rabbiting on very, very quickly. But it can also happen because we may be perceiving time in a slightly warped way. The world slows down when we're in a heightened state of alertness. So what might feel like the same pace as, you know, I'm talking, I, I, I feel like I'm talking at the same speed as when I was practicing, you know, when I was in a state of calm and I was just on my own doing that. I might feel like I'm doing exactly the same thing at the same pace, but it's actually a few beats per minute faster for everybody else listening. And I think this is something to be curious about and experiment with. And if we have the bravery, maybe even to record ourselves in different situations, to notice those differences, notice the alterations. You know, it's a really interesting way to raise awareness about the, the difference in experience, you know, how we feel and think about something that we're going through at the time it can actually be radically different when we observe it from the outside. Um, and this kind of awareness is really interesting and can help us to, to build tools to help us um, find the best pace for different situations you know am i rushing am i dragging you know just feeling like okay this this talk am i is this relaxed do i feel relaxed like what what are other people's responses to this and i think a lot of this is also about making space to do things slowly if we want again it's it's the usefulness thing it's the um, bringing tools into our toolbox You know, we can get sucked into thinking that we have to change everything about our lives and embrace slowness in all that we do. But I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that's actually particularly helpful. It's far more useful to consider the things that we don't want to rush and allowing those aspects to be as slow as we want them to be, as deep, as gentle, as intentional, measured and deliberate. So let's return to that question of what we mean when we talk about slowing down in life. What is it that we're talking about? Maybe we're thinking about life itself. I don't know about you, but I find the speed with which time flies pretty terrifying. Um, I don't know if we experience the perception of time in the same way as people throughout history, but I've got an inkling that with all the ways that we can stay occupied there's less boredom on offer um, or at least less reason to be bored so with time spent consuming more entertainment and scrolling through stuff in the in-between time is kind of eaten away perception of time is a very real thing you know 10 minutes spent exercising seems to go a lot slower than 10 minutes um, in flow doing something enjoyable (laughs) you may you may enjoy exercise but if you're doing really like high exertion exercise it's probably going to drag a little bit more than you know like doing something fun uh so there's an option for slowing down time do painful things maybe the work day seems to drag and take ages to pass but then your evening disappears in the blink of an eye and before you know it you're back at work it's like (laughs) i've only just left um I guess we've reached a bit of a sticking point there. Like slowing down doesn't necessarily, I'm not sure we're after making ourselves miserable, though that is an option um, for slowing down life. So, yeah, I don't know. What sits beneath this desire to slow life down? What do we feel is slipping away? Is it because we're not doing enough of what makes life meaningful? Is it because we're doing too much stuff? and that we can't keep up and it's like i just need everything to slow down so that i can catch up is it because we're just experiencing a natural sense of disappointment about time passing because there's that too isn't there we can't actually stop time that's a bit sad sometimes maybe the desire to slow down 
is a desire to do the impossible. It's not that anything actually needs to change. It's not that we're doing anything particularly wrong or different than what we would choose to do if we re- chose to do it. Um, actually, we we really quite enjoy life. We quite enjoy the stuff that we've committed to and we've chosen to fill our lives with. But it's just that the passing of time is kind of frustrating. Perhaps it's not about changing anything other than maybe allowing ourselves to be at peace with reality in this sense, to embrace life as the passageway through time that it is. I won't dwell on that. I'm just putting it out there. So what about some other aspects of slowing down? Our endeavours, things we enjoy doing, slowing down ourselves in relation to those things that we enjoy, not rushing through tasks, through projects, through things that we are uh, embarking on. I guess we need to think about some of the things that cause us to rush them. A lot of things to do. Maybe that's one of the things that causes rushing when life feels a, a bit like a to-do list and you know we've got all these things on our plate we've got to get through this so that we can get to the next one and get all tick all of these things off as quickly and efficiently as possible so i guess the solution we're after there is not necessarily slowing down but it's about doing less maybe outsourcing responsibility for certain things or getting help with things if we focus on slowing down but still have the same number of things on the to-do list just going to increase the amount of strain and stress on our plate, aren't we? It's just going to be like, oh, I've got all of these things to do and I'm doing this really, really slowly. I'm supposed to be doing this slowly because that's, you know, that's what I feel is the, the solution to this problem of rushing. But I've still got all these other things that I need to get to. Um, and there's not enough time to do all of them at the pace I'd want to do them. Yeah, this is just one of those obstacles that we can hit when we approach it from the wrong angle, I guess. So the question is, if I wanted to take my time with this thing, is this thing important to me? I want to take my time with it. Would I be able to? And if I can't, if I can't give as much time to this um, as I want, what's preventing me from doing that? Might be that we're speeding through for no reason. (laughs) <laughs> or our to-do list is just full of things we've added because we've been trained to fill our time, haven't we? Maybe we've learned to fill our lives with this kind of busy work, the perception of usefulness and productivity, like this sense of, well, you know, I can do that at this speed. and I'll do it as fast as I possibly can. There's plenty of time for all of these other things. And do we leave that potential time to do the thing that we want to do slowly? Perhaps we've learned to associate slowing down with laziness or a lack of ambition or being a waste of space. There's a lot of value judgments and stories around worth that we associate with the pace that we uh, bring to life. And many ways we shape our lives so that we might avoid the critical and judgmental voice that might have a go at us otherwise. That's worth bearing in mind. As well, you know, if you feel stuck between the desire to slow down and this injunction to be busy and to rush, some pretty deep scripts that can give us reasons not to take our foot off the gas. Another aspect of slowing down that's kind of worth thinking about is the impact of rushing. So if we're doing things fast, what effect does that have on those things? I don't know if you've ever had that experience of, you know, being flustered, you're maybe running late or something and you trying to get something finished or tidied up or you're trying to get get ready as quickly as possible and you end up knocking things over and making things sloppy and generally creating a bit of a mess <laughs> in the process and and rushing can do this kind of it can lead to mistakes and misunderstandings and accidents which can ironically actually add more stress to the plate because it's like okay I'm, I need I now need to tidy all of this up I need to um you know make amends for this mess that I've created Um, and sometimes rushing just gets us where we don't want to go a lot quicker. (laughs) Um, and so it's worth questioning who or what is causing us to rush. You know, is someone wanting us to maybe make a quick decision? Is this really necessary? Are we trying to avoid something? Are we afraid that we're going to miss out if we don't do this quickly or get there fast? What would it mean if we missed this opportunity? Is there freedom in that? Maybe actually there's something potentially quite liberating 
about missing this opportunity. Is it unclear what's stopping us from slowing down? Maybe we've just got this inner script running and it's like, I've got to do this as fast as possible. It's like, who's saying that? Where's that coming from? These are questions that deserve time and attention. Uh, You know, there's as much value in figuring out um, what we want to rush for as there is in working out what we want to leave time to do slowly and to do calmly and without uh, time pressure. Maybe there are urgent conditions that mean we do need to act fast in order to get something important. You know, maybe tickets go on sale for something that you really, really want to go to, something really meaningful. And it's like, no, I've got to, I've got to really act fast for this. Make that a choice rather than a default. You know, learning to enjoy slowing down isn't about rejecting fast pace. It's about choosing it when it's necessary, when it's useful. Pace is a tool that we can pull out of the box when life requires it. But only if we're not completely exhausted by trying to use it all the time. You know, you can only sprint at the end of a long distance run or race if you pace yourself through throughout the rest of it. If we live life in a constant state of sprinting, urgency, anxiety, scarcity, then we're going to be exhausted when we encounter something that we want to throw ourselves fully into, that we want to go full tilt into. But if we really got to the bottom of what slowing down means, I'm really not sure. <laughs> it's actually quite hard to talk about in a universal um, and abstract sense. Maybe we can think about some ways that we might reject attempts to make life quicker and more efficient. Music comes to mind for me uh, from a few angles. Like if we consider the accessibility of music in the modern world, with streaming services giving us access to more or less any song we could possibly ever want within seconds, you know, there's no obstacle to us being able to listen to whatever we want whenever we want it. There are ways this adds something to life, for sure. Like, it's great, isn't it? (laughs) But at the same time, as digital music becomes more prevalent, so too does things like vinyl collecting and people buying albums and record players. Like, why bother with that when you can just get instant access to all the music your heart desires immediately? Like. What what are you doing? Some people will try giving some kind of, you know, audio file scientific explanation. Well, it just it sounds better. Uh, it's it's the way music is supposed to be heard. I know I know a few people who have ears good enough to, to really tell the difference, but not many. <laughs> and that's not what this is about. You know, even if you tell yourself that's what it's about. It's not that they're offended by the pristine quality of lossless audio. Um no, they're kind of aware of a secret. They might not actually be aware that they're aware of, uh, which is that the obstacles we place between us and the things that give us pleasure are the very sight of life's enjoyment. When we remove the obstacles, we eliminate our capacity to enjoy life. Um, you know, slowing down in this sense actually makes life more enjoyable because it stops us from getting what we want whenever we want it. And that sounds kind of like a uh, absurd I don't know, a contradiction. And maybe it is. And it is. (laughs) It's one of life's beautiful contradictions. You know, if you want to enjoy music, make it harder to access. I find this with songs and albums. You can listen to your favorite songs whenever you want, as many times as you like. It's great. Like, yeah, brilliant. But they might sound better when there's an album in the way or there's the other album tracks in the way. There's something really interesting about reaching a favorite song on an album and how it feels like uh, a gift. It's nestled in among the other, other tracks, and it's like, yeah, we've gone on a journey to get to this. It takes time to reach that place, and you know it's going to only last a moment before you leave it in the rearview mirror of your ears. The earview mirror. <laughs> nice. Um, this, this might not be the same for you, like in this context, you know, it's a thing for me because of my relationship with music, but I'm sure that you, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm sure you have things in life that become more meaningful and enjoyable when you put obstacles around them. Things you might have assumed you wanted shortcuts for, or maybe other people have assumed you want shortcuts for. So you get you stuff like maybe a Christmas present that helps you get something quicker and more easily. And then you're like, I've sort of lost all the joy. Why has that happened? And you realise that actually 
it's not having the thing. It's not having easy access to it that makes it what it is. It makes it the the kind of it put that's what injects joy into this whole endeavor. And I guess this is the hipster modality, isn't it? You know, make things hard. Uh, take 45 minutes to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> the coffee itself, yeah, it's pleasurable when you get there. But you realize actually the enjoyment is the process of getting to the coffee. Um, in terms of it's the enjoyment's found in, in not having the thing. It's in the possibility of getting the thing. It's Yes, it's in the practice of, of preparing the way for the thing. Um, and in this sense, absence is what makes the heart grow fond, isn't it? it there, there's, this is kind of true with all manner of things. And I wonder if anything comes to mind for you in relation to uh, this area. These are ideas for how to slow down, I guess, in a weird way. Ways that are relevant for you and the stuff that makes your life meaningful. You know, if you love watching a certain TV show, do you binge watch it? Or do you put space between the episodes, make an event of it? You know, Thursday night, that's the night that I watch an episode of my favourite show. Maybe maybe that's kind of enforced by the, uh, the scheduling of a TV show. That's really helpful sometimes when you don't have that option of the binge watch. You know, I've experienced it with things like sport. I absolutely love watching live sport. And getting TV packages where you can watch it, you know, all weekend and whenever you want, kind of takes a lot of enjoy, uh, enjoyment out of it. And I remember as a kid, we didn't have Sky Sports, we didn't have any, uh, anything other than the, the five uh, terrestrial uh, or four terrestrial channels that eventually became five here in the UK. Um, and so never, I never watched, pre- they never had Premier League football on, um, on TV, on those channels. And so, you know, cup games would come on every so often and that'd be like a really special thing. I remember, I remember certain games. I remember watching certain games um, now, like even when I was a kid, um, that, that really stick out in my mind because they were rare. Um, and maybe this isn't about slowing down per se, but I think, I think these kinds of things are linked. You know, in a world where we have easier and more instant access to whatever we might want whenever we might want it, we become entitled, not in the, in the sense of necessarily like um, an overt entitlement, but like this sense of I- implicit, in, I don't know, intrinsic entitlement to stuff that ends, us, ends up bringing us less joy. This might be the same with other things like food, you know, when your favorite meals can be delivered within an hour uh, or you can just pop to a shop at whatever time of night to get something. I don't know, like, does, yeah, information and knowledge that can be attained within a few clicks of a phone. This is great stuff. It's, yeah, and I'm not, I think, and this is the, the real contradiction and the real um, sense of being being it being necessary to hold contradictory truths at the same time, which is like this is both great and also it's an issue. <laughs> it's an issue. It's there. There is an obstacle to our enjoyment here. So I'll come back to that question. You know, with all of this instant access to stuff, uh, what does it enable us to slow down? Why do we feel busier in a world that does everything faster? It's a baffling question. Why does it feel like we have less time to dive into a book slowly when we read all the other books on our list in just 20 minutes? It's kind of weird. Unless we're consuming and absorbing an abundance of stuff that we don't actually care about, that we would choose not to um, if it wasn't there in such a, an easy, easily instant accessible way. Things we're aware of because of those same tools that make things more efficient um, and things that draw us away from stuff that actually we would want to draw broad circles full of margin and slowness around uh, if we really thought about it. You know, in a world of ready meals and uh, instant delivery services, why does it feel like there's less time to cook? In a world of streaming services, why do I listen to a smaller range of music? In a world of instant access to knowledge, why do I feel like I don't know anything? What if the questions 
are that way around, not in a world where there is no time, what services are going to make things quicker? It might not be true, but it's a question worth entertaining and grappling with. Is the solution creating the problem? Just come back round to that question of the book club. Spending four months on one book. How does that sound to you? What might that make possible? Does that seem like a complete waste of time or a rich, deep, expansive experience? Do you think of fast as good, slow as bad? Do you find the idea of slowing down uncomfortable when there's so much to do and see and experience? And then when there's always more to do and see and experience, where do you stop to feel the joy of it all? Are you able? Or does it just become this never-ending treadmill? How do you see speed? Shallow, hurried, scarce, full of potential misunderstandings and mistakes. When we thought about deep processing a while ago, we thought about how um, taking the time to process things deeply actually breeds an awareness and a wisdom that allows potential for quicker and better reactions and reflexes when required. And I think this is the same when we make space for slowing down, for going deep with the things that matter to us in life. We develop and nurture perspective and understanding of what we're able to let go. We know what we want to choose to pick up and what we can simply allow other people to worry about. When we're caught in the treadmill of keeping up with every shortcut the world gives us, we're kind of at the mercy of something beyond our own choices, beyond ourselves. I describe myself as a slow coach, partly because it's an insult that I find quite funny to, um, you know, embrace. (laughs) Um, And putting those two words together uh, after I gained my professional coaching qualification just felt like, yeah, I like that. It's kind of gently rebellious, isn't it? Um, In its everyday use, slow coach, you know, all one word, is an insult for someone who's moving or acting um, slowly coach being like a stagecoach, but like as a type of transport that moved slowly, but only moved slowly uh, once quicker modes of transport were developed. I'm, I'm sure at a time when it first came to be, a stagecoach was, was quite quick compared to other ways of getting around. Um, in the same way as like postal mail became snail mail once email was invented. You know, it's all relative. Um, but yeah, I've developed this idea of slow coaching as something that I think can help us go deeper. Um, It's kind of this deliberate placing of time, you know, where a speedy coach or a high speed train might get somewhere rapidly. A slow coach, if we're willing to give it the time, will be more adventurous along the way. When we go slower, we explore more. We, We might see more. We might hear more. We might process more deeply with more awareness about ourselves and about the things around us which means that we can hear what is actually being said. It's true for um, other people, like the things that other people are saying. We can actually, when we slow down, we can hear what is it that they're actually saying and avoid those misunderstandings that come from rushing. But it's also true for ourselves. Slowing down helps us to see, hear, smell, taste, feel more of what is around us, what is within us not simply what we anticipate is there. When we rush through a book, we only understand what we already understand. We latch on to familiar patterns and concepts and read our own meaning into the words on the page. If we rush through, we don't take time to truly hear, to truly understand what is written, especially if it's giving us things that we've not thought about before, concepts that are new. Or when we're listening to podcasts or audiobooks at a faster speed, we're going to hear things we already know. And we're going to miss things that we're unfamiliar with. Because our brain is looking for familiar patterns. So even in those situations, we think we might be learning when we absorb book summaries at speed and consume audio at a high pace. We're not taking in much that we don't already have a frame of reference for, if any. So it's kind of a false economy in that sense. 
So as we finish, I want to ask this question. What's the rush? What do you have time to waste on today? If you chose to slow down and truly listen, play, create, observe and enjoy, what would happen? What would you need to let go? What could you let go to create buffer and margin for that more meaningful stuff? What would be the most helpful question to ask yourself this week when it comes to making time to slow down? The book club taking four months over a single book is an example of uh, the slow coaching approach that I bring to The Haven, um, which is the online community that I run um, that started back in 2014. And since that time, it's been deepening and evolving and growing over the past eight and a half years as I'm recording this. And one of the things that's consistently said about it by uh, members, uh, both old and current and people who have been and gone and come back and all of those sorts of things, is how safe it feels because of this, the, the pace and the rhythm that, um, that it travels with. I've seen many people come and go through the doors over the years, which is something I love because I've seen many people arrive at the answers that they're seeking on their own as well. The things that people bring when they arrive might change. It might take a few weeks, it might take several months or even years, but things begin to shift when we slow down enough to listen to that voice within us. And that's what it is a sight for. As a coach, I believe that we all have the answers within. And when we ask the right questions or ask more helpful questions, we can begin to explore them in meaningful ways. That's why the Haven has evolved to be a virtual village. It's built around spaces, rooms, buildings, places to go and be to still our minds, to open our hearts and connect with what's alive in us. The library, for example, is where the book club gathers and reads together, exposing ourselves to the wisdom of familiar strangers, soaking in ideas and questions that have been grappled with throughout history and bringing them into the present, holding them up to the light of our own lives and sharing that road alongside others. The theatre is a dark auditorium of creativity and inspiration, new features, resources and expressions of creativity to enjoy and experience. Replays of our live sessions that take place in the circular cotter, a place of refuge and encouragement, a shelter from the weather, somewhere to stay warm, to talk, to laugh, to care together about things that make life worth living like the cafe where you'll find friends old and new as well as finding moments of peace to yourself with a cup of something tasty in a personal project and then the fireside is a comfy area of deep reflection and slow coach conversations to dream to imagine to look back and to explore the possibilities as you look forward As I hope comes across in my words, the haven isn't somewhere you rush to. It's not somewhere we tear through at speed in order to find the magic. It's a labyrinth of cobbled streets, candlelit corridors and secret doors to other worlds. And I've been building this over the years. And as I've done so, it's always carried an aliveness and awakeness. It's not somewhere to consume. It's somewhere to create. It comes to life through the people there, the connection, the breath. Some people come and dwell, they find quiet sanctuary and move around in their own way, quietly present, a beautiful part of the gentle energy. Others come and connect, creating friendships and social rhythms that give structure to their routines. Their presence gives voice to the community inspiring the shape of things to come. We explore nine themes throughout the year, 
moving over familiar and friendly ground in new and inspiring ways. This kind of repetition is about deepening growth and renewed vision. Roots. Foundations. Seeing old things with new eyes. So, do you fancy joining me in the Haven Book Club for a slow and deep dive into the courage to be disliked? Or maybe you just like the sound of that uh, environment, that village. It's all part of the membership, along with access to the archives and conversations that have been there since the start. If experience is anything to go by, we're going to end up with a lot more in the book club than simply knowledge of the book. We'll have a deeper awareness and understanding of ourselves and the way that we want to hold and use and let go of these ideas in the book. I can't say what that's going to look like or what it will mean for our lives, but I know that it will stick in our memories and create significant moments of enjoyment and connection along the way. Um, So I'd love to invite you to join me if you're interested. Uh, Just go to the dash haven.co as in the hyphen haven.co um, and I'd absolutely love to welcome you into our lovely little friendly home. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, do get in touch and let me know what's resonated with you, uh, what questions you might be asking yourself um, as you think about what slowing down might mean for you um, and the possibilities of that for your life and where you'd love to experience more slowness and gentle rhythms in your life feel free to email me andy at andymort.com or get in touch via social media Uh, i do read every email i get i try to respond to them all as well it might take a while Um, expect slowness nothing personal Um, just seems appropriate Uh, yeah so i don't think i have anything more to add Um, i hope you have a lovely week and until next time do remember that even when it appears not to be Gentleness is always an option. All right, take care. Bye-bye.